52. The rest of reckoning. Leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, that is to full growth. Hebrews 6 verse 1. As hungry and growing believers, we press on. But we don't press to produce. The Holy Spirit instills within our being a determination that will not be denied, a hunger that must be satisfied. Our pressing on to his very best is fostered by the fact that we will never be satisfied in ourselves, but we will always be satisfied in him. We are ever being drawn forward because of our realised need for freedom and growth. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Thank God for our needs. They are the primary impetus towards his abundant life. Remember the wretchedness, agony and frustration we knew, with very little hope of assurance that things would ever improve. We were overwhelmed by problems and not yet aware of his answers to them. But we continued on in desperation, for deep within our spirit there was a constant yearning for freedom from the struggle and rest in his life. Our striving ebbed and flowed, but there was never a moment of rest. During our enslavement by sin and self, the faithful indwelling spirit did not let us give up. When the Holy Spirit has brought us into the depths of Romans chapter 7, we have learned enough about self to acknowledge that it brings forth nothing but death. Romans 7, 24. Then it is that the Spirit centres our attention anew on the Lord Jesus, and we realise that he, not our futile struggling, has provided freedom from our bondage. Who shall deliver me? Oh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7 verses 24 and 25. Thus, when our reliance is wrenched from self and every other broken reed, the Spirit has us prepared to rest on the written word and in the living word. By means of the identification truths, the Spirit shows us the finished work of the cross and our life in Christ, and we begin to reckon. Oh, what a difference our new reliance on the truth makes. We press on with more determination than ever, and with an ever greater hunger for his best. But now, the wonderful contrast is that in the midst of all our pressing on, there is rest. The struggle is gone. We have entered into his rest because we know the facts. We know our position of freedom through the cross and life abundant in our risen Lord. Now we have the assurance that as we reckon on the truths, the Holy Spirit will cause us to grow in them daily. There is rest in the midst of growth. The word presents an interesting paradox concerning this rest. We read in Hebrews 4, 9 to 11 the following. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labour therefore to enter into that rest. It is certain that there is no rest of faith as long as we struggle to produce. And the hungry heart will not cease its strivings until the truth of the finished work is seen and counted upon. This is the principle of rest. 
by which we were born in him and by which we grow in him. The actual labour that is mentioned in verse 11 has to do with believing. It's quite an exercise to reckon that we died to sin and self when we are keenly aware of their presence and manifestation in our life. And it is also labour to believe that we are new creations in Christ when we are so definitely alive to the old man. The earlier reckoning concerning our assurance of salvation and security in Christ is preparation for the later reckoning in regard to identification. Diligent reliance on the specific truth of the word in the face of all else to the contrary is our only ground for rest. We cannot cease from self in any other way. We cannot even rest in Christ apart from counting on the revelation of God's word. No matter how far we progress in our growth, there will always be a degree of this labour involved, turning from the testimony of the temporal to the eternal witness of scripture. This especially is necessary because self will never change. It will always be simple, never possessed of one good thing at all. We must ever count on the exchange of the cross to separate us from the influence of self freeing us to rest in the life of our Lord. Knowing and resting in the finished work of our identification causes us to be neither slack nor self-confident. Rather, knowing what he has done for us on the cross and with us in Christ makes us all the more hungry and eager to know experientially what is already ours positionally, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verse 6. There is every scriptural reason about us to be perfectly confident in the Lord Jesus for our growing to maturity and not to be discouraged by the length of time it takes or by the unchangeableness of self. We are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Romans 8, 28 and 29. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 13. His dealings with us for our growth, especially as he makes us a grain of wheat to fall into the ground and die, may not be very restful, but our rest is in him and in the precise statement of his word. We abide in Christ during the processing required for us to be brought to the fulfilment of his purpose. We do not fret and struggle because we are not mature the moment that we see his standard for us in the word. And there is another very important aspect of rest. And this has to do with our witness to others. When we first begin to receive some of the benefits of reckoning, we are bent on teaching the truths of identification immediately. We know just the ones who need this victory. Oh, it's easy to forget how long it took for us to come to the threshold of this realm of reckoning and how thoroughly we had to be prepared before we were at all interested in the so-called deeper truths. Oh, but we soon discovered that there are very, very few believers who are very responsive. It is wise to remain comparatively quiet about the liberating truths for the first year or so following our awakening. After a period of reckoning and deeper study, 
we will not only know better what to share, but how, when and with whom. Our teaching should be in the attitude of sharing. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the word of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Once we begin to reckon, some of us make the mistake of seeking to straighten out our pastor and the church along these lines. Oh, but our testimony must first be observed by others and then heard. Only hungry, prepared hearts can receive. Often barriers are raised by premature teaching and these may take many years to remove and sometimes they are never overcome. No, it's better to go slowly, to go at his pace and to make progress that abides. Actually, the pulpit is not the ideal medium for sharing the truths of identification. No matter how sound and alive a congregation may be, there are only a few individuals at any one time who are ready to enter into the truths of the cross. The Spirit would have us prayerfully watch for the hungry heart, feeding the few in preference to offending the many. Furthermore, those about us have a right to observe over a period of time whether or not our witness and our walk are valid. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Galatians 6 verse 9 Part 53 Results of Reckoning it should be evident by now that the truths that we have been studying are interrelated and interdependent. Together, they form a single unit of truth centred in the cross and our risen Lord. Their express purpose is to conform us to the image of God's Son, to consolidate and conclude our study. Let us consider a few of the results of reckoning. First, the continuity of the cross. In Romans 6, 11, we read, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Having reckoned upon a finished work, we must be prepared to experience the results of the position taken. Counting ourselves to have died to sin at Calvary is synonymous with taking up that cross. It is to be expected that the result of this is daily crucifixion. In this connection, the principle of distinction in chapter 10 is to be remembered. Our dead-to-sin reckoning includes two factors. First, the old man crucified, and then the new man as having died to sin. The old man crucified. Our reckoning the old man as crucified results in the Holy Spirit's leading us daily in the path of the cross. He allows us, chiefly through our own mistakes and willfulness, to become enmeshed in situations and circumstances that hold the self-life on the cross, that crucify it and that break its power. Oh, there is nothing easy or pleasant about the cross, but we learn to glory in it because of its crucifying power, which frees us from the law of sin and death, as we read in Romans 8 verse 2. And then the new man dead to sin. As we exercise the reckoning attitude of having died to sin, and hence take up our cross daily, the result is that we enjoy increasingly the freedom and the abundance of our new life in the risen Lord. We find that the death that we passed through at Calvary now stands between us and the grip of sin and self. In our standing, we count on the crucifixion of the old Adamic source. In our state, we find ourselves always delivered unto death 
for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 4.11 This dying daily both holds the self-life crucified and manifests the Christ's life in us. The continuity of the cross in our lives produces continual freedom from the reign of sin. The next result of reckoning is the continuity of manifestation. Again, Romans 6.11 says, Consider yourself to be not just dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The foremost reason for reckoning ourselves to be in the glorified Lord is that his risen life may be manifested. Although our life is hid with Christ in God, his life is not meant to be hid in us. The wonderful fact about this reckoning is that out of our being always delivered unto death, out of our being made conformable unto his death, his resurrection life emerges. As long as we are in this unredeemed body, which is vulnerable to temptation and prone to sin, we are going to have to count on the crucifixion of the cross to deal continually with the Adamic life within. But the very things that crucify provide the daily death from which our new life in Christ is to be revealed. The more death, the more life. In 2 Corinthians 4 we read this, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So the continuity of manifestation has its source in our continual conformity to his death. The next result of reckoning is the continuity of life out of death. In 2 Corinthians 4.12 we read, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. This is the cumulative result of our life out of death reckoning. What is the essential characteristic of the Lord Jesus that is to be manifested in us? Well, it is the sacrificial quality of being poured out for others. We are not struggling believers who barely exist until we finally fall into heaven. We are recipients of resurrection life for ourselves and sacrificial life unto all others. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10 verse 10. When we reckon ourselves alive to God in our risen Lord, we are thereby taking our position as seated with him in the heavenlies. We know that the anchor and source of our life is safely and eternally hid with Christ in God. We are assured that nothing and no one can touch us apart from his blessed will. See Romans 8, 35 to 39. Our attitude is that of looking down on all that he takes us through. We are not under his circumstances but above them all in our victorious Lord. Standing in our position, we learn that in whatever state we're in, therewith to be content. We learn how to be abased, and we learn how to abound. Philippians 4, 11 and 12. We enter each day, even Mondays, each day and each situation from that blessed vantage point of looking down. Resting in our risen Lord gives us rest in our pilgrim path. We abide in him, accepting everything from his nail-pierced hands. In everything give thanks, we're told. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 
Now, always to be remembered is the fact that the one in whom we live in glory is forever viewed as a lamb as it had been slain. Revelation 5, 6. While we abide in and reckon on our life in the Lamb of God, and while we're taken through the Spirit's processing, his sacrificial lamb-like qualities will be manifested in us and through us. Death works in us, but life in others. Another blessed result of being always delivered to death is a growing knowledge by experience of our crucified, risen Lord. As the Holy Spirit delivers us day by day to the path of the cross, we suffer infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions and distresses for Jesus' sake. That I may know him is, is closely related to the fellowship of his sufferings. Philippians 3 verse 10. Our confidence in the Lord Jesus develops as we realise that his grace is sufficient for all these things and that his strength is made perfect in, in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. We are compelled to prove his faithfulness at every point of need. Although we are living in our risen Lord, we are camping in this body of humiliation and serving in this world of death. Therefore our Father keeps us in the place of need and helplessness in ourselves. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 As we are kept dependent we grow in his submissive, yielded life. We read in Hebrews 10, verse 9, I come to do thy will, O God. Abiding in the Lord Jesus, it is effortless and natural to yield. The only struggle in the matter of yielding erupts from the self-life. That source never was and never will be, nor never can be in the subjection to the Father. See Romans 8 verse 7. Paul's urgent plea to the believer's yielding and consecration is based on reckoning. In Romans 12 verse 1 we read, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. To present our bodies is to yield our faculties, our new life in Christ. Yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, a new creation, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, Romans 6.13. Yes, life out of death reckoning results in our becoming a living sacrifice. Such a one is always delivered to death. But out of that daily death, new life is constantly manifested. Our reckoning maintains us in the life out of death principle. This taking up our cross renders us as a grain of wheat and results in our losing our own life. The Holy Spirit buries us here in this situation and there in that location so that we might not abide alone, but that there may be a rich harvest of golden grain for Jesus' sake. It is comforting to realise that the same process of the cross that holds the old man crucified causes the new man to be manifest. The burial of the grain of wheat makes the old life powerless and the new life fruitful. See John 12, 24 and 25. Some of the graves out of which Christ's sacrificial life arises are the ministry, the mission field, the home, the school, the hospital and the place of employment. Are these not the very places in which his resurrection life must be manifested? 
where his poured out life needs to be shared and received. It is as we reckon on our heavenly position that we are able to rest in any grave, whether it be the ministry, the mission field, the home, the school, the hospital, or the place of employment. He has prepared us, rejoicing in his victory that emerges from our daily deliverance to death. We abide in the Lord Jesus, that he may bring us through all the processing required for a fruitful life and service. Not somehow, but triumphantly. Hereby we learn, as it's written in 2 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16, that all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man, that is our new man, is renewed day by day. And in Romans 8, 28 and 29, we read and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Oh, take heart, reckoning pilgrim. The continuity of life out of death leads to the crown. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, verse 4. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Part 54. Foundation of Reckoning. Reckoning in our life union with the Lord Jesus Christ establishes us in the full assurance of salvation. On this foundation we are able to reckon on our eternal, unconditional security in him. Until we are grounded in the truths of substitution and union, we are not prepared for the more demanding reckoning of our identification with him in his death and resurrection and on to ascension. The believer who doesn't realise that he is eternally secure in Christ, a birth true for babes, is certainly not going to be able to trust him for emancipation from sin and maturity of growth. Those who begin weakly and are not instructed concerning their position in the Lord Jesus are apt to remain weaklings. They move mainly up, down and backwards with rarely any forward spiritual progress and abiding growth. For the most part, they subsist on experiences and so-called blessings and they seem to go from one crisis to another, never really settling down to reckon on the risen Christ as the source of their life here and now. It has been felt necessary to include the following selected materials on eternal security. These truths may be of help to any believer who is attempting to enter onto the reckoning of identification before they are settled in that of justification. If you recognise in the word of truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Saviour because he is God the Son, who became the Son of Man, and as such bore in his body the sin of the world, and if you rest in him in self-surrender for fellowship, relying with confidence on him alone for deliverance from the guilt and penalty of your sins, and from the power of indwelling sin, then there are twelve proofs 
that you can never be lost. One, because in the eternal sure purpose of God, you are a vessel of mercy and will finally be conformed into the image of his son, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, for which he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 9, 23 and chapter 8, verse 29. Two, you can never be lost because God's infinite power is no longer hindered by your sins, but can wholly keep you safe, for the blood of Christ still removes your guilt, for he is the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 2, verse 2. Another proof that you cannot be lost is because God's love for you, supremely expressed at Calvary, can now be manifested much more and so accomplish his every desire for you. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled, to God by the death of his son, how much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 5, 8-10 A fourth proof that you cannot be lost is because of his delight in the son, God can never reject the prayer of the son, asking God to keep them which thou hast given me. I pray for them, said Jesus, for they are thine. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given to me. John 17, verses 9 and 11. A fifth proof you can't be lost is because the death of the Son, having a value equivalent to the punishment demanded for all your sins, has paid also for the sins you now commit. Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yes, rather, and is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, and who maketh intercession for us. Romans 8, 1 and verse 34. A sixth proof is because by the resurrection of Christ, God has broken your connection with Adam and joined you to Christ for acceptance and life. You being dead in sins... Hath he quickened or enlifted together with him, Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses? So yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And the quotes were Colossians 2.13 and Romans 6.13. A seventh proof you can't be lost is because although your sin can hurl you into hell, Christ, as your advocate, defends you. Christ is entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself Hebrews 9 24 and 26 an eighth proof is that because Christ ever liveth to make intercession for you Satan has no power to unsave you Hebrews 7.25 says he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. A ninth proof is that the Holy Spirit has taken over your body as his personal, permanent home. John 14.16 says, I will pray the Father, and he shall send you another comforter that he may abide with you for ever. A tenth proof is because the Holy Spirit has planted in you the very life of God, making God your real Father. John one thirteen says, Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
An eleventh proof is because the Holy Spirit has now united you with Christ and you are a very part of himself. For by one Spirit are we baptised into one body. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. And the twelfth proof that you can never be lost is because the Holy Spirit in you is the seal that your salvation is a finished transaction. In Ephesians 4.30 we read, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Though your present sin cannot unsave you, remember that there are other penalties to bring upon yourself, the least of which is the chastisement at your father's hand. And in Hebrews 12, verse 6, we read, Do not faint when he corrects you. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Further, to accept and teach that a blood-bought child of God can fall from grace is to assault the very nature, character and sovereign purpose of God as well as his justice and his love. Such teaching is an assault on the nature of God in that believers are declared to be partakers of the divine nature in 2 Peter 1 verse 4, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, as we read in John 1 13, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, John 14 verse 16 and 17. It is not only an assault on the nature of God, but also an assault on the character of God. His faithfulness and truthfulness is that the life he imparts, he gives his pledge to maintain. His promise is this, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, John ten twenty eight. And in John 5.24 we read, And shalt not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Also the doctrine of falling from grace is similarly an assault on the sovereign purpose of God as set forth in Romans 8.28-30, where the believer is seen in the purpose of God in the eternity of the past in God's foreknowledge and predestination, and in the eternity of the future, sharing the very glory of Christ. John seventeen twenty two to 26 And then there is an assault on the justice of God, in that God declares concerning the believer, Your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3, verse 3, and that there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, and no separation from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, verse 1 and verses 37 to 39. And thus we can thank our Heavenly Father for his justice. For it is this which preserves the child of God from a second charge. Payment. God cannot demand payment twice. First at my bleeding surety's hand, that's Jesus, and then again at mine. Lastly, it's an assault on the love of God, in that God declares his love as an everlasting love, from which nothing shall be able to separate us. For he is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jeremiah thirty one three, Romans eight thirty nine and Jude verse twenty four.